So hello, everybody, and welcome to this version of Presenting Our Presence. Presenting Our Presence is a vodcast that celebrates the contributions of Indigenous people at the University of Alberta. My name is Florence Glanfield, and I'm Vice Provost Indigenous Programming and Research. And I'm one of the co-hosts, along with my colleague, Dr. Janice Cindy Gatet. And today, for our session, we have our colleague Tom Hunter joining us. You'll also see that our a colleague Kyle Napier has joined us on the screen and may pop in with questions as we go along in the conversation. Tom, thank you for being with us today and please introduce yourself in whatever manner is most comfortable for you. Thank you. Thanks, Florence. So my name is Tom Hunter. I'm a uh... I'm a member of the Satellite Cree Nation. I've uh, been at the university. I started as a student in 1993, and I began working here in 1995, and they haven't been able to get rid of me since. I uh, currently live in a little town 80 kilometers away from Edmonton called Mundare, Alberta. It's pretty famous for its sausage, the real one and the big one that people laugh at as they drive by. And I'm coming to you from my brand new cubicle in Rutherford South, where normally I'm by myself. But today, of course, my, my boss is wandering around the back. So if you see her scurrying back and forth, uh, my monitor is pointing straight at her office. So we're all good. Thanks, Tom. And could you tell us a little bit about the work that you do at the University of Alberta? Okay, so I'm a, my title is Collections Assistant. And if you owe the university any money, I'll be glad to take it. But that has nothing to do with my job. I'm a, I work for the University of Alberta Museums, and I work with the art collection. And my job involves a lot of preventative conservation of the art collection. I do a lot of work with storage of the collection and monitoring the environmental conditions. It also involves a lot of uh, boring database work so that you're able to get in good information on our website. I do a lot of uh, installation over my years, different exhibit prep art handling. I pretty well do whatever they ask me to. Right now, it's pretty quiet here on campus. So I've been, I've been the only one really authorized to be here every day because it's pretty hard to do my job remotely. I can't look after the art or check on any kind of circumstances. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. We're getting more tech in, in these days. There are some things I can check remotely, but I'm old. I don't trust them. I want to open the door and go and have a look for myself. So I also, you know, I got to be involved with some of the Indigenous issues here on campus, repatriation. And I we're talking about some contentious artworks that are on campus that we're, you know, trying to figure out the, what's going to happen with them. So generally, you know, I, I would jokingly said when we were uh, getting ready for this, that I have been going to university for 27 years and still have no degree. And you know, that's true. And over the, over the course of the years, my boss asked me, you know, do you want to take some courses? And I thought, no, you know, because as I watch different people move up in, in their positions and become curators or assistant curators, it took them away from the collection. And I all, you know, I came here to, to work with art and put, put my hands on the art, and, you know, I still get to do that, you know, so even after all this time, I'm still just a collection assistant, but I, you know, I don't believe it's just a collection assistant. Pretty important to the, to the disposition of the art collection. 
So, you know, not, not say, taking anything away from curators or any of the other people. Conservation is also pretty big in my, in my job. Not that I can do a lot of the conservation, but I know what I can't do. So I know what I should and shouldn't be doing to this art. So that's a little bit about what I do. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And it seems to me that it's um, been almost 30 years since you joined the University of Alberta. And you said you came to the university as a student. So what is the story of the student into transition into employee that um, that you tell? Well, it's just, uh, it's the story of being in the, in the right place at the right time. In 1993, the, the Métis Nation was putting, put together a pilot or a pilot program to train First Nation people. Well, they were, they were talking about Métis people on, uh, on the technical side of libraries, archives, and museums. And there was, I see, I can't remember, it's that long ago. There was about 30 of us that started. And it was a 50 week program with 27 weeks of practicum, nine weeks in each field. And we started this, uh, we started this journey off with a bus trip and we got to go to the Glenbow, we got to go to Head Smashed In, we got to go to Nakoda Lodge, we got to go to, you know, what were big Indigenous sites at that time. There wasn't very many. And then also, of course, the Royal Alberta Museum. So it was a way for us to get to know each other. And, and as, we were, uh, as we were training, the different people that came in to train us were saying, you know, they're trying to start, cram about six years worth of education into your head in 50 weeks. So good luck. But you know, I think 23 out of the 30 of us graduated from this program. And I haven't kept track of a lot of them, but I know some of them, you know, some of them came from the library world. So they, they went back and worked in libraries. One of my colleagues did, did stuff with history and, you know, her sister is working at the, in St. Albert, but she's unfortunately passed. Cancer's taken her, but she was, you know, there was lots of, lots of interesting stuff. And I was talking about, you know, when I came here, I, I, it was totally because of my wife, right? My wife worked at the Métis Nation and she said, man, they're doing this awesome thing. And, you, you know, all you have to be is, uh, is, Indigenous and unemployed, and guess who fit that that job, that job description? So I I took this course, and at the time I was working in warehousing. I worked for General Electric shipping light bulbs all over Western Canada, and uh, I took the course. And when I finished, I got a job as a ca as casual help at the library. I was making $18 an hour when I was working in the warehouse and I got paid $8 an hour when I worked at the library. So I thought this is a wonderful career shift. You did a good thing. But luckily Janine Andrews, who's the, she's retired now, but she was the director when I, when I was going to, when I was during doing the course and she was also one of the instructors. She said, you know, she said, Tom, if I could find some money, I'll give you a job. And I started working in January of 1995 for Museums and Collection Services on a three-month contract. And I worked for 13 years on contract for the U of A. Luckily, they have a staff association. So after the first year, I was able to get benefits and pension, you know, start paying into the pension fund. But it was, you know, it was every year. You know, and when it came to the performance evaluation, you know, when I'm, I'm not that quiet, you know, I said to Janine one day, she said, I said, I don't care why you hired me. What I want to know is why you're keeping me. Because right then, you know, there was, there was a lot of hiring of people that had 
nice little skin tone like this just for for that reason right and you know i didn't want to be just that token indian as that's you know that's that's the terms we were using then and that's what i was doing too <laughs> so there was a she didn't realize i was not being so tongue in cheek about it when i said that but uh you know it was good she kept me on and probably three, four years after I was here, she called me into her office and she said, if you want to keep working for me, you have to straighten up and fly right. She gave me some directions on where I should be going and who I should be talking to. And I did that. So from, you know, from pretty close to that time up until today now I've been 23 years clean and sober and it was all because that woman saw something in me that I couldn't see myself right I thought I was fine you know I thought well geez everybody walks around smelling like a skunk <laughs> it's traditional <laughs> but uh, you know Things, things have gotten so much better because of that. You know, I, I wasn't thinking she was such a nice lady then. You know, I was thinking you should be minding your own business and leave me alone. And, but little did I realize how much she was going to help my career. So I'm, I'm forever thankful today that, you know, I got hired by Janine Andrews. things I used to tell students when they were when I got a chance to talk with them was that museum work is not all white gloves and glory there's a lot of times I was laying underneath very heavy things with dust falling on top of me holding them up so that we could attach something to the wall artwork can be can be very heavy lots of lots of stories I could tell you like that about what goes on behind the scenes you know, I can remember if you ever get a chance to go to the Prince Study Center, you'll see it has a big horseshoe shaped table. That's all one piece. We carried it up the stairs by hand in the, to the third floor of the Fine Arts Building. <laughs> so that's just one thing. <laughs> not all, yes, no, it's not all easy. That's why I got bad shoulders, bad knees. <laughs> I'm old now. I leave that to young people. <laughs> so it's all good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Tom. That's so powerful. And and um, now tell me, what what observations have you made about changes at the university or changes in practices um, that you've seen over the the 27 years that you've been here as an employee? Well, there's been a lot of changes, not only at the university, but like in the museum community itself. Like I was, I was pretty lucky. I, I sat on the board of the Alberta Museums Association and was on that board for seven years and in the position of director and also as the president. So I got to, you know, interact with people both at the provincial level and at the national level. So, you know, I got to know a lot of people in the Canadian Museums Association. And like I said, when I, when I, when I first got involved with this museum stuff, I remember my very first Alberta Museum Association conference. It was in St. Albert and it was in 1993. And Douglas Cardinal was the keynote speaker. And something, something he said has stuck in my head. You know, he said, we need to be brave. We need to have courage. 
And he used the analogy. He said, imagine yourself, he said, standing on the edge. Of, he said, you're standing in a great big spoon and you're standing right on the edge of the universe and you have to take a step off. He says, you have to be brave and you have to take that step. He says, and don't worry about it. Even if you fall flat on your face, you're still making forward momentum. And that, you know, that made so much sense to me because, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like my shirt, you know, in a world where you can be anything, be deadly, you know, have forward momentum. And I've always tried to do that, you know, because I was, you know, I don't, I don't think there was an indigenous president of the Alberta Museum Association before, you know, it was, it was new stuff. They, they didn't know what to say about me because, you know, I wasn't that guy that had the big degrees and, you know, knew how to write all these reports and everything, but I wasn't afraid to speak up for, for, for the, for the indigenous people and you know what what where we needed to be in the museum community so and at the university i can remember you know like part of the the orientation for us was to meet the tip coordinator and some of the tip students and to see what was going on then and there was no first people's house and there was nothing and you know there there was not very many students you know i think i think there was probably four four or five hundred of original students then or maybe not even that but you know today there's so many and we have there have so many good supports and today in the you know in the museum community they talk about equity and they talk about inclusion and, there's a, there's a lot of different people that that are involved and taking taking positive steps I think Let's see it's all it's always a, it's always a challenge people don't always hear you but they they seem to be moving a little bit more and there seems to be a shift in the way of thinking within museums and collections as well. Like it, um, I remember attending a session one time where there was this, uh, it was one of the museums in Ottawa where they talked about how they had um, initiated dialogue with communities about what the, what the, um, displays were going to look like, for example. But even like so many of our artifacts used to be extracted from our communities. And, and I just don't think that that happens in the same way anymore. Does it, Tom? Or how have you noticed that in relation to artifacts in relation to community engagement within the museums now? Oh, no, it's really it's really different. I mean, there's laws. <laughs> there's laws that they're actually abiding by now and collecting. And they, you know, they, the research we have a, we have indigenous researchers, which which makes a world of a difference, right? And even here on here at the U of A, we have you know Métis women. Or Keisha is working with the archaeologists, and so. And then there's more, like it's, they're not trying to tell our story so much anymore. They're, they're, they're starting to, to ask. And, you know, it's, it's funny because like when I first came, you know, and we were talking about repatriation and, oh yeah, give it all back. I want it all, we're gonna give it all back. You know, today, today I don't think so much that way. I think that, you know, sure if there's if there's a good place for it to be and you know under the proper conditions because a lot of these things wouldn't be here today if museums didn't take the same care that they did of them like not to say how they got them again they've not always been legitimate legitimately collected or legally or morally in a good way 
collected, you know, a lot of stolen objects in the in, you know, in museums and, you know, our ancestors you know, in boxes, you know, so, but today, today, I think there's more respect and more, but it's, you know, it's like anything in the world. I'm sure there's, you know, there's not very many people I know nowadays who are just totally, you know, it's ours and we're not giving, giving it back. Well, there's that one incident in, in London. <laughs> Been stealing things forever. It belongs to my great, great grandmother. I think her name is uh, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what are what is a memorable experience that you've had in your work that you would like to share with our audience? Memorable experience I had is I'm, I'm trying to remember what that new school new school brought in a bunch of inner city kids, indigenous kids in, and we were allowed I was I was allowed to bring them into our collection space and show them some of my favorite things in the collection the things I I thought they would have so so much stuff to and they asked some awesome questions and you know we have as part of our collection we have a, we have an Egyptian mummy and I got to take them in there and show them this mummy. But I also got a chance to tell these little kids about ethics, you know, cause they said, why is he over here? You know, why is he in this storage room? Why isn't he out there? And what I said to them, I said, you know, I said, how would you feel if your Muslim passed away and somebody just put him in a glass case and said, hey, come and look at me, come and look at me, you know, come and look at my thing. And, you know, they just, oh, yeah, that would be good, right? And I said, yeah, I said, well, that's the same thing with this. This guy was somebody. And it's not always, you know, respectful to just show him off as something. I said, if people want to come and have a look at him and learn about him, but it's not a, I said, this poor guy was, how that mummy came to us was he used to be riding around in a converted school bus and somebody said, here, give me a dollar and look at my mummy. And I think so, <laughs> it's, you know, not, not, not being handled in a good way, but at, you know, he came from England at the time, it was just a thing for the British people to collect Egyptian artifacts. And apparently a person is an artifact in their mind. So, you know, so we have this mummy and I get to see him every other day and I talk to him. People say, why do you talk to him? I said, because, you know, he's, he was a person, he's respectful. I said, in my belief, you know, the people in the spirit world are just there. I can talk to my 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 relations anytime, and I think they hear me. So maybe this guy hears me too. Not plus, I don't want him to be chasing me around either. So I gotta stay friends with him. But so far, you know, 26 years, we're still good buddies. I love that you have this diverse work that you do. You take care and protect and, and conserve these valuable objects and spirits that are in our collections. And you get to teach about it, Tom. That, that is so beautiful. And to have those youth at youth school, seeing our collection and seeing the pieces that are your favorite. This envelope is full of letters from those kids. <laughs> I keep it right in my desk, right beside me it's from the office of the chancellor. It's, you know, thank you, Mr. You know, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Adder. You know, so it's just, just to, to show them that, you know, and get to show them some 
weird stuff. <laughs> and stuff that's really cool and yeah. stuff that they'll remember. Like those experiences, I believe, will stay with them in the same way that the experiences and the stories that we heard as young people from our mushums and our kukums and right i mean it, yeah. it's really yeah yeah that's really beautiful now tom i'm aware that we're almost close to the end of our time together i'm wondering if there was anything else you'd like to share today that you've well, learned well you know i just it's funny because me and kyle when we when he said something that i kind of felt like when i first got here is that I don't know if I really belong here because I came here without, you know, having a degree and I'm not even, you know, didn't think I should be here. But today, I, today, I believe I, I truly should be here. You know, I have 26 years of experience of working with objects and artifacts and artwork. I've learned art by osmosis. I get to work with wonderful people all over campus. And it's right from the custodial staff up to the president's, you know, office staff. Not so much me and him, but he knows who I am. And that's crazy. You know, the last three or four presidents, I've been able to, you know, do, do stuff with them in their office or different exhibits for them. And, you know, don't be afraid to stick your neck out and try and do something different. Like, you know, it's really weird for me to say that because I'm usually the biggest chicken there is kind of thing. But you know, I'm a big guy. I have to look tough, be brave. But inside is that little boy who says, I don't know if I should be here or not, but I'm going to stay anyways. So, you know, don't be afraid to try something different. You know, I, I get to handle art that's anywhere from, you know, a, one of the important lessons the late curator Jim Corrigan taught me, he says, you know, because I was really nervous handling this artwork because some of it, you know, six, seven figure, some of this stuff in this collection, that's what it's worth. And he said, Tom, he said, it doesn't matter if it's worth $2 or $200,000. It deserves the same care if it's a, if it's in our collection, and that you know that made it a, a lot easier for me to handle this art because I wasn't shaking so badly, and then that made me say, okay, I need to treat this little piece of art just as as good as this other one. It doesn't this just doesn't deserve to be treated with any less respect just because it's not worth multi-million thousands of dollars somebody worked hard to make that so those those kind of things tom i think those images that you've shared and the stories you've shared with us today are so powerful and i take us back to that uh first time you heard douglas cardinal talking when he said standing on the edge of a spoon and take that step move forward and you've talked with us today about the courage that that takes to take those steps and you also talked with us even like with this latest example with the late curator about the value of the objects but in so many ways that's the value of being in a human being too is that every single human being deserves the love and compassion of uh, from others. And when you talked about the objects in that way, I was thinking about how all those little people that you interacted with were taken care of in the same way that you would take care of the relationships that you have with, you know, Douglas Cardinal, <laughs> the president of a university and you share that compassion and passion for the work that you do with everybody. Thank you for being a part of our community and a part of the amazing community at the University of Alberta and for your long time contributions. Because we all we have all benefited from you being there. We do have beautiful collections 
And I remember the first time I met you in a crowded room. And I knew that I wanted to get to know you more because collections and artifacts and the care of them are near and dear to being part of the story that we as Indigenous people get to tell. So thank you, Tom. Okay. Hi, hi. <laughs>